my name is Marcus Rennerson. I live in Duval, Washington, down in the Valley, about an hour and a half south of here, in the traditional territory of the Snoqualmie people. And it's been really, really nice to take a stroll up the I-5 with all the budding cottonwoods and the flowers and big leaf maples coming out to Bellingham and the traditional territory of the Lummi people. And um, yeah, thanks for having me here to the uh, speaker series. I work mostly for an organization called the Wilderness Awareness School, which is a nonprofit environmental and wilderness education organization for youth and adults. I spend most of my time, or almost all of my time, working with uh, our year long university level program for adults. It's a nine month immersion into natural history, wildlife ecology, tracking, and environmental leadership. And I'm also a conservation photographer. I also enjoy other types of photography for fun and pleasure. Art, mostly what I like to do with my imagery is tag them onto stories that tell um, a narrative of place and tell a narrative about the complexity of um, what it means to be human in the 21st century, what it means to be human for myself uh, as somebody of uh, settler colonial ancestry who is deeply attempting to connect to place and what that means in the 21st century um, as we all try to find a home here on the landscape uh, where there's people that are not from my ancestry who are indigenous here. And um, it's these stories that get complex and they get murky, and they get unclear. And um, what I've found through my work in conservation and nature connection in general is that uh, there can be this tendency to want to find uh, an answer quickly, or want to find something that's simple and something that's clear. And I often find myself in that boat and realize that that's actually just kind of pushing the river, that what we need to do is actually move towards complexity and to nuance and to um, uh, just kind of have the tenacity to dig into that and have, a, have challenging conversations and um, take the time and the space and to check ourselves in that as well uh, to enter those conversations and I just got a little bit of a background from the folks that are here and it sounds like all of y'all are involved in some sort of environmental field or interested in that in some way, be it the sciences or humanities or policy. Is that somewhat accurate. Maybe just like a shout out of anything that doesn't fit into those really huge boxes I just named. Geography, environmental ed, education, training. Nice. You all just got up. Yeah. <laughs> anything else out there that people are still doing? Awesome. Well, that's all. You are needed in the world. Um, it is, I find myself oftentimes these days um, sometimes feeling hopeless and it feels, uh, it feels bleak. And then um, what I tend to do at least 51% of the time thus far is what you know, tack my sails in a kind of good enough way to keep me moving forward is, is that that uh, can be this huge opportunity. Um, we're entering into um, the, 20, the 21st century is calling us as conservationists, as educators, as activists, as scientists, as policymakers, is calling us into this place that we've never been before. Um, and at any point in history, I think people have said that at some point, but right now there is just so much happening. And we need some creative, inspired, and resilient humans out there asking the good questions and having the challenging conversations um, and really digging in. And one of the things for me that's been really important in that is actually cultivating and, and sustaining my own deep connection to the place. Um, I, for a long time, and I, I, I did a lot of this in my head and I was very cerebral and very intellectual and I still find myself kind of falling into that groove a lot. Um, but to get into a more embodied, more corporeal connection place has been really huge for me. Um, and as people entering into this work, this is one thing I would really put out to y'all is find, 
find a way to get out of your head with all this stuff and make sure that you, you connect to place as a real living animal like you are and find that in somewhere, wherever that is, and have that connection to be able to be a resource for whatever you do, wherever you go. So that's a little bit about what I do at Wilderness Awareness School. And I also work for an organization called um, Cyber Tracker Conservation of North America. And it's a funny name. Um, it started with Cyber Tracker International. Um, and it started off uh, by a man named Louis Liebenberg, who's from South Africa. And he, he wrote a book. It's out of print now. It's called Tracking the Origin of Science. And it, his basic posit was that it was through the art of wildlife tracking um, that humans were able to start to tune into patterns and recognize patterns and gather data and interpret them and make stories about them and make meaning about them as they live lives. And so tracking was the first science, so to speak, which actually allowed humans to find mammal food and find more protein, which gave, um, which created a larger brain in Homo sapiens, and so the tracking is actually directly related to us becoming the, the human animals that we are now. So that was kind of his thing, and he started doing a lot of conservation work there, and what he realized is that the Bushmen of the Kalahari, and, and just South Africa, that southern part of the continent, southern Africa in general, and Namibia, and, um, those areas were the best ecologists around, and that actually they, were the ones who had all the PhDs in uh, the flora and fauna of that place, so to speak. So he was like, how can I get them to help engage with this? And what he was also noticing was the kind of expansion of Western colonial culture moving into Africa was also really, and agriculture was taking over, was really kind of clearing out all the hunter-gatherer culture that had been around for eons. And so he saw the Kalahari as some of the best trappers there were. And so his thing was, well, I can get data out of this, and I can make tracking relevant in a modern world again, and thus help some cultural preservation for the Bushmen, the song Bushmen happened. So, and he realized, like, all right, I gotta do this, and with his team, so how can we get the Bushmen involved in this? They weren't literate in, in, um, in the languages there, uh, you refer to the, the dominant culture's language, so he decided to use some iconography on back then, it was a palm pilot, Maybe many of you have never actually been across the pilot before. Uh, but it's, um, it's so they can go out and whatever they're seeing the tracks and sign of, they can just plug it in by a picture. And I called that uh, software CyberTrack. Uh, and so then he realized, well, I need to create some sort of proof that these folks know what the hell they're actually doing and are legit in the scientific world. So he created an evaluation system, an assessment system. And that system also became known as the Cyber Tracker Wildlife Tracking Evaluation. And it then spread to North America through uh, biologist and author Mark Elbrock in 2004. And now many, many thousands of people globally. It's just gone to Europe recently. Many people, in a, several thousand in North America alone have been certified. Uh, in their field skills and their interpretation and identification of the tracks and the sign left behind by the fauna of the continent. And I'm um, in training and in October will become one of the nine evaluators for that system in North America. So that's a little bit of the other work that I do. Um, and all that together kind of led me into this world with uh, photographer and conservationist David Moskowitz who perhaps some of you have heard of, a um, colleague and good friend of mine in 2015 asked me to join him in this endeavor to go hopefully scare up some caribou in the Pacific Northwest, some mountain caribou, and get some photographs and maybe write an article or two and kind of tell some cool adventure stories. Because caribou go to incredibly stunning places that adventurers like myself and Dave and perhaps some of you really like to go to as well. So we went up in the summer of 2015 into British Columbia to start following the trails literally and the work through the caribou, the disappearing caribou. Um, and what we found is that, like I said earlier, um, we had way more questions than we had answers. We went down a rabbit hole that we were not expecting and into this world 
where there was so much complexity and so little simplicity, like I once thought there might be. So I'm going to just share a little bit about our journey, just a, just a bit. Uh, we have we um, wrote a book called The Caribou Rainforest, which is up here. We've got a few for sale. There's also postcards and stickers for free. Just grab one if you want. Um, but uh, we also created a documentary, a five-minute documentary. I'll show you the trailer here at the end of my talk. And those are kind of the two main things that we put out to tell this story of what we found out and to actually use it as an advocacy piece for conservation and to really bring to voice not just the, the voices of the species caribou, mountain caribou, but also the ecosystem that they call them. What we, we quick, quickly realized was this was an ecosystem issue. And when we say ecosystem, we're talking about the humans that live in this place and the economy that's laid over the top of these landscapes. Um, and to really amplify the voices of the humans and the non-humans of the inland timber rainforest, which is just this absolutely amazing stunning ecosystem, only about 500 kilometers east of here. That's a little about me. I'm just going to go through some slides, and we'll, I'll show you some stuff, and you can ask me things about stuff. So, um, let's see where we get to. So, we have some little works here. Um, so, we started this group, we just called it the Mountain Caribou Initiative. And it was, um, I'm the one with the great hair there. <laughs> On the lower right, uh, Dave Moskowitz behind me, and then to his left, Colin Erisman, who was the director of our film, and then our colleague, Ken Shelton. And all of us met each other, knew each other from the Wilderness Awareness School. Dave and I used to work there together, and Ken and Colin were two of our students over the years, and have now become good friends and colleagues of ours. And I just have this stunning love of photography. I love the way that images can tell stories like they're shared. And a big part of this project that was so amazing for me was going into these incredible landscapes and looking for caribou and spending days getting bit my mosquitoes um, doing that. And um, it's amazing how, how finding caribou is like finding a new one in a haystack. Um, but the landscapes were absolutely incredible. They like to go, um, they like to make living, living in places that other things just don't like to go. And if you're gonna go find caribou, you have to be willing to get your feet wet for sure. Um, this is in mid-July, by the way, um, up in caribou habitat. <clears throat> but we went to some absolutely stunning places in search of these magnificent animals, and we did not see that many, but we did see enough to tell our story, but just to be able to greet the places where these animals and so many other beings and plants and trees and people of both settler colonial culture and indigenous ancestry call home currently, um, it's places that are some of the most stunning outdoor adventure and recreation destinations globally. This is at Rogers Pass, which is the home to North American mountaineering. Anybody here a mountaineer? Anybody been to Rogers Pass? Get some backcountry skiing or mountaineering up there. Pretty incredible. Caribou roam there quite a bit. And I think there's two there left now. It's in Glacier National Park uh, of Canada. Glacier National Park of BC. Um, up into, um, all the way into the uh, north central British Columbia. Uh, we had to find all sorts of means to get to the places that we wanted to get to to find these absolutely stunning beings amidst some uh, incredible, incredible landscapes. And there we have Dave in the Tonquin Valley of uh, Jasper National Park up in on the border of BC and Alberta. And those right there along Amethyst Lake shore are the tracks of mountain caribou, which were the first ones that we saw on this project. And to come and stumble across those was just so, as a wildlife tracker myself, it was just incredible to see their, to see their sign. Eventually, a couple days later after the shop was taken, I was able to see 
see my first Mount Caribou. And we got to see the tracks of so many other beautiful things. You all see the tracks in there? What do you see? There's a bear, right? What else? Right, so those, yeah, so you see the bear on the left, the soft-footed animal. You see the ones on the right, the really sharp, sharp jabs. They're just as big as the bear tracks. And there's, yeah, so just incredible landscapes that you have to have your awareness up in and keen in, bushwhacking is a different ball game up there. And what we realized, though, as we moved through these landscapes, there was another species whose tracking signs we saw a lot of very frequently, which was having a significant impact on these places. And the kind of dominant settler colonial culture of what is now, you know, the, the main ambient culture in North America, right, is the, these are the impacts of that. These are the tracks and signs left behind by that, of which I am certainly a part of. Um, I'm part of a system that creates these tracks on these sunny landscapes. I assume that some of you in this room are as well. Um, and that's what these questions, this, these are the questions that Becky me as a conservationist and as a storyteller is like, you know, not just putting narrative out there, but really saying, where does that narrative sit inside of me? And how do I situate into that? And how can I take accountability for that? And then step into <coughs> good action. So this was part of the rabbit hole that I was telling you about that we started to go down for and we did see caribou. This is the first mountain caribou that I ever saw. This is a photo from Dave, actually, and that caribou is walking directly towards me. I was over on the left, and it, it caught me, caught wind of me, and it just, it started walking slowly, like it had interest, and then it just started trotting at me, and just like pretty fast. <laughs> I, was like, I was crouching there, and Dave's over here, and he's shooting with the camera, and I was like, and I'm just going to sit here and then about for me to you in the brown hat right here I was like it's time for me I just didn't didn't want to pressure it or stress it or anything I was also getting a little stressed myself and I got up and kind of marked a big thing and just stared at me and I went back and got and kind of went off and did its thing but it was a really incredible experience in the Northern Rockies to see a baby like that. And we went on to photograph and check these animals out in many different parts of the range and many different times of the year to really learn about who these mountain caribou are. And a lot of you have heard of caribou and they exist, they circumnavigate the polar region of planet Earth. <coughs> They've got them in Siberia, and they've got them up in um, northern Europe, and all the way around up through Canada. Um, and until last um, fall, last November, um, they came down into the United States a little bit. And the last herd that, to come into the contiguous U.S., the lower 48, has since been extirpated. But um, there's caribou all across, and many people, when they think of caribou, they think of a lot of people think of these really big herds of barren ground caribou thundering across the Arctic. And that's um, the same species, Ranger for Tarandus, but it's a different subspecies. There's the barren ground caribou and then there's the woodland caribou. And actually here it says that those green parts up there are the woodland caribou. But in fact, any everything except those furthest north ones, so the green, the orange, uh, and even the brown are all the subspecies of woodland caribou, and then there's different ecotypes of woodland caribou expressed. And mountain caribou is the most threatened ecotype, and what we found to be one of the most unique as well. Um, and those are the ones that call Pacific Northwest. They're defined by instead of migrations north south in these massive numbers, they do, they kind of stay pretty much in the same area, but they migrate up and down to the tops of hills and the valley bottoms, and they do that migration twice a year. And they're highly adapted to um, the temperate rainforest <coughs> as well as the high subalpine and alpine environments uh, of this corner of the globe. So here's a little bit of a zoomed in picture of the, the current range being the dark green. 
and the light green, just where they occur a little bit, and then the hash marked red salmon color there is their historical range, coming all the way down almost um, to north, uh, down in northern Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Washington and Selkirks in eastern Washington. And it shows that there's just this little population that comes down into that area. And again, as of November, that's no longer there. Um, they're highly adapted to the snow. And what's that, what does that foot do? It's a snowshoe, right? That's basically what that foot is. Um, that's my hand there. You can see their tracks. They're just these incredible size tracks. They're just as large as a moose track, or actually they're a little bit bigger than a moose track, except they're significantly smaller beings than a moose. Um, they are adapted to go where no other being would want to go, um, and particularly this is a really harsh environment up in the in Alpine. Um, they start in the spring down in the lowlands, and, they, and historically they've evolved to be connected to the inland temperate rainforest, and for those that don't know, there is, um, we think of rainforest typically, or temperate rainforests as, as just along coastlines, and we're in a temperate rainforest right now. And there is a temperate rainforest that's about 500 kilometers inland, where the Rocky Mountains, basically the Selkirks, the Columbia Mountains start to go up, they catch moisture, push it up, and create another actual rainforest. And it's with that that the mountain caribou have evolved. And so they start off in these lowlands and they've depended on these old growth to feed for eons before they go up to these subalpine meadows in the summertime. And this here, this image, I love this image because that's like classic, like that's a signature for mountain caribou. If you're in mountain caribou habitat and you're adventuring on ridge lines, and you're like, where could I go look for some sign or set a trail camera? You look for a meadow like that, and you're like, bam, I'm going to go down there around that pond, I'm going to go that lake, I'm going to try to set a camera up and see if I can get some caribou. And then in the fall, they head back down into, uh, for another green up in the lowlands as everything that they're feeding on, the high up stuff, has, has started to dry away where they go back for a fall green up down low. And then they do this really unique thing where in the winter time, whereas most hoofed animals, ungulates, will go down low, right? And herds of elk are getting notoriously, they just go way low in the winter time. Mountain caribou decide that they're going to go back up. And, um, and they use those snowshoes for once in the year. And so they can go up into these subalpine regions. Here, uh, can you see the caribou in the picture? See that little arc of seven or six dots right there? Um, <clears throat> they're a little bit higher in this picture, but they'll go up so that now that the floor is basically raised, they can feed on their bread and butter for the winter time, which are um, a form of particular black lichen called Briaria. And that is that is their winter time staple, is feeding on these lichen. And of course, these mountain ecosystems are home to so many other incredible beings. And as I said, this really became an ecosystem story, a story of ecology and the place um, of the, the beings that live there. And this is a photo of that Briaria that they are seeking out specifically in the wintertime. Has anyone been to the inland temperate rainforest before? Anybody spent time in the Selkirk Mountains? Or the Columbia Mountains? Or the Heart Range up in Northeast? So northeast corner of Washington, northern Idaho, northwest corner of Montana, and then up into BC, up to um, just above Jasper National Park before the flat happens where the Rocky Mountains. 
taper out. And that whole west slope and on down in the valleys there is all inland timber rainforest. And there's a whole lot of desire for humans to go up there too. And what we found up there is that this mountain ecosystem, this rainforest, mountain or snow forest that it's sometimes called ecosystem, has some of the most valuable timber stands on planet Earth. And it's this interface of mountain caribou and the modern human that have contributed to um, why that little final patch of green that dipped into Washington, Idaho is no longer there. It's a complete loss, or fragmentation, I should say, a significant loss, not complete yet, but a significant loss of of their habitat. This is a guy named Dave Walker, who is a tree feller for, I can't recall which logging corporation it is, up in just a little bit north of Rattlestone. And Dave and I went out there for a day and a half to, to hang out with these loggers and to, to photograph their operation. And um, Dave was such a sweet, sweet man. And in fact, with me on a hemlock that he just dropped, um, hemlocks they refer to as trash trees, um, so that was a 500-year-old uh, hemlock, 400-year-old hemlock maybe that he just cut down so he could get to the cedars. This went to the pulp mill, and we tracked it to the pulp mill, and it became toilet paper. Um, and you can see he didn't really care where he dropped the tree, right? It was just like get it out of the way because he dropped it poorly and it cracked. Right? He wouldn't do that with the cedars, but. Um, it was this story that was just, just really, really heart wrenching to see and to kind of see these impacts and see these, to see the caribou habitat um, going to places like this, so that it can get sold to Lowe's Hardware in the United States um, and become debts from people's suburban homes. And again. There's, um, there's nobody, you know, not our story, our, our focus here isn't to, to demonize anyone. Because again, I'm part of that story too. And as I was saying about Dave, the tree feller, he was one of the sweetest, coolest dudes we met on our whole project. He was so kind to us that he would, he would take these old growth trees down and he'd sit on the stump and he'd cross his leg and he'd light up a cigarette between every tree fall and he'd just sit there and he'd let point stuff out. Tell us about the glaciers, and we'd be like, yeah, you know, like just like, I love this. This is amazing. And he was really quite soft spoken, though. And he'd tell us about the grizzly bears that he'd seen. And at this one point, I was up the hill and I was filming him taking down the cedar tree because I wanted to get it through through the forest. And like, the edge of where they were clearing up to was way up high, so I was in there. And he's he's setting up to to take down this old growth cedar, and he puts his saw down and he's like, it's a toad. <laughs> and then like, he's over and I come back down and he's like, oh, that's a toad. And he's like, he's like telling us about these toads that he's found, how he loves toads and this other toad that kind of crawled up his foot one time. And he was like, all right, everybody, you like, up the hill, you know, go to safety. And he cranked up his saw and um, took down 600 wheels here. And it's stories like that that you know, really hit that home. There's no easy answers here. He's just doing what he's got to do to make a life. And what is that line between accountability and between compassion? And like, how do we say, like, yeah, some sort of change is going to have to happen, and we're going to have to adjust, right? And it's like, but it's not just Dave that's going to have to adjust and find a new job if we want to save habitat, right? Like, I've got to do that too. And what is my connection to Dave? And that's just a thread that I'm following personally. And I think as all of us, as we get into this work, we, we need to all ask that for ourselves. Um, so, like I said, the big question here is, or the big theme is habitat fragmentation, habitat loss. And so what we're up against now are these really bad options for keeping the caribou's nose just above water, so to speak, so it can hang, so it doesn't drown, right? And so there's all these things happening right now. Um, predator calls, right? Anybody familiar with the predator calls up in BC? Right? 
wolf packs that are getting shot up there so that the, they can take care of caribou, right? Or familiar with um, all sorts of habitat closures. I don't know if any of you are snowmobilers or heli skiers or anything like that, right? So kind of shutting that down. Um, or these supplemental feeding programs. This is an intense image, right? Um, and again, like, how am I connected to this image? Um, Supplemental feeding programs, helicoptering in food to make sure the caribou can get these food in these key spots during the thinnest of times. Um, and then there's, um, so you see the caribou again? What's behind them? Helicopter. Um, there's a maternity <coughs> pen project hap happening right now. It's um, a really incredible program. And I was in a helicopter above that helicopter taking this photo. And if you can see, there's a, there's a human leaning on the rail, out, down, and that human's holding a net gun. Um, and this helicopter is chasing this herd of caribou so that they can net a pregnant female. Tranquilize her. I helped load her into the helicopter fly back to that clearing. They're on the small clearing in the middle. The really, really clear one, not the clear cut. A smaller one. Offload them and snow machine them into that clearing where the pregnant cow caribou can live her life, give birth to young in the, sum in the late spring, early summer give them all the lichen they could ever want <laughs> until they can get big enough to be at least have a chance to be uh, to outrun wolves and bears and mountain lions. And this project led by um, two First Nations partners of ours, the West Moberly First Nations and the Soto First Nations of Central British Columbia has been immensely, immensely successful. It's really been the leadership, the First Nations leadership. This is Roland Wilson, who's the chief of the West Mogley First Nations, and this is Naomi Owens, who's the Lands and Treaty Director of the Soto First Nations. <coughs> this is Harley Davis, who's a wildlife monitor for the Soto First Nation. And it's these three folks who have um, really led the charge and saying, look, if the British Columbian government is not going to do anything about it, we are. And so they've kind of taken it in their own hands and um, created a network of partnerships to say, like, look, we're going to at least we're going to at least take care of our caribou. We're going to take care of the caribou that our people have a coexisted with. And the caribou took care of us for eons, and so now we're going to do something about it. And now, um, just recently, it's um, in the last couple weeks, um, because of Soto and West Moberly leadership. The province of British Columbia and Premier John Horgan have passed this caribou protection plan, which includes the caribou in the region of the Peace River, which is up there in central British Columbia where Soto and West Moberly are, and it's including all this habitat protection and a moratorium on old growth logging in a lot of these areas, as well as a protection of all, a whole host of other species that call the human temporary forest home. It's been really incredibly inspiring to watch them, and of course, there's been a huge backlash, and um, a lot of, just recently, a lot of really racist backlash um, towards the West Mountain Minnesota for asserting their rights under Treaty 8, which was signed in the 1800s, and said that um, there's going to be no interference with the traditional ways of life, and the fact that they can't hunt caribou anymore is an interference with their traditional way of life. And so they're asserting the treaty rights to say, hey, we gotta get caribou back, therefore you've got to save the rainforest. So they're really leveraging their treaty rights to help make a change. And of course it's not simple. There's a lot of pushback there. But it's in some really inspiring uh, indigenous leadership and that's where it's all going down. And, um, even here in Washington State, the Kalispell tribe um, finally said, we're gonna we're going to save this Selkirk herd. And there's 12 animals left when we finish this project. And then last year there was three, and now there's nothing. 
because they took the last two and they put them in a pen and turned them again up in um, near Revelstoke in the hopes of having success like they did with their pen to bring those animals back. But as of now, those animals aren't in that state anymore. So these, this tribal and this First Nations leadership has really made this key difference. And so it's this project, you know, that got us out into these cool places, meeting these incredible humans that are dedicating their life to this ecosystem and to the people of this ecosystem, you know, the, the mammals and the plants and the trees of this ecosystem. And I just, it just reminds me as I get out and I adventure and I roam across these landscapes that I love so much and photograph so much beauty and have so much enjoyment um, and seek out the stories of this place that um, it's, it's not just a playground. Right? It's, it's a lot of beings, both human and non-human, it's their, it's their home. And any of us that get out there and play, it's important to remember that. And as, as advocates and activists and scientists and storytellers and conservationists, um, please make sure you remember that. As you root in and you connect to place, remember that um, yeah, it's, not just, it's not just a playground. Um, it's a place that needs allies, that needs support and amplifying voices. And so through setting these camera traps, I'm just going to end here on a uh, few that we caught up um, here. It's a little bit north of Kootenai Pass. We set this one camera trap. This is my colleague Colin uh, setting the trap. That's Dave there setting one trap. And then uh, Colin go. But, so we're setting these traps. And um, we came back to find them. We're like, oh, I think we can take care of here. We're seeing tracks. This is the perfect place they'd be. And we came and checked this camera trap. And we're like, oh, it's, oh cool, big more sheep. Oh, cool, there's a deer. And there's another one. I don't have the photo, but the camera was all messed up and tweaked. And there was a black face in it and everything. And one of our cameras was totally destroyed by a bear, <laughs> by a black bear. OK, great, there's a bear. And bears were, God, we had this phrase, and it's like, oh, I hate bears. <laughs> because they would just wreck your trail cams. They just would go and just mess it all up. And then, on one of our last few shots, we're like, damn, God, we got two not in care of this spot there. Um, uh, a mama and her calf. Mount Caribou are the only deer family member where the females grow antlers as well. Um, short, short ones, but. Um, and just end with a few images from the, the Southern Selkirk period. Um, and it's just a reminder of what people call these gray ghosts. And um, this big bull right here that you're seeing is now uh, no longer alive. And um, whether or not this one is or not, this might be one of the two that's in the pen up in Relistoke. But um, over these last few months, there was a precipitous decline. And one of them was killed by a cougar, um, and then others were just, maybe it was avalanche, we're not sure, um, maybe it was car heads. But <clears throat> while we've got these band aid solutions of doing what we can, you know, the predator control is working a little bit, the maternity pending is working, um, staying out of recreation sites for caribou is, is working. Guess what, um, guess what was right behind this, like kind of big picture behind this sign that says caribou protection, no snowmobiles. Guess what was just behind it? A clear cut, right? And guess who's funding this campaign to uh, close off recreation and to, uh, do, to fund the wolf call? Logging companies. Because um, they, they really want the caribou to stay around. Um, and so I just, you know, just end with saying this is um, Kootenai Tribal Chairman and some biologists from the Kootenai Tribe who were uh, fighting tirelessly and have been in, in um, partnership with the Kalispell Tribe to, to, for the maternity pending project with the final self, South Selkirk members. Um, and just want to just encourage us to remember that there's so much going on that if uh, the conservation <coughs> issues are, they're truly social issues, they're not ecological issues. 
they've got an ecological impact to it. That a caribou is going to do what a caribou is going to do. A grizzly bear is going to do what a grizzly bear is going to do. The cedar trees are going to do what a cedar tree is going to do. But the conservation doesn't work for the humans and the landscape for whatever reason. We've got the power to do. Right? And there's many theories on why that is and beliefs on that. But we've got it. That's just a fact. And we need the ecosystem. We we, we make that. That's an ecological bottom line. How are we going to use that power? How are we going to wield it? How are we going to implement it? It's got to work for people, and we've got to have some connection and partnership across the difference there, or else, you know, we're going to keep going the one way, disappearing. And it's a hard story, and it's a really hopeful one. There's a lot of good work being done out there, and there's a lot of change happening. It's just inspiring for me to see a room full of people who are dedicated to this. So, few things that we would encourage you to do is support tribal and First Nation sovereignty and help amplify the voices of indigenous leadership wherever you are. What are the Lummi up to around here? Right? There's a caribou issue, but what are the local issues? Right? What are the Lummi doing? What, what allyship do they need right now? I don't know. I'm not sure, right? And other, other Coast Salish tribes and First Nations around here, what are, the, what are they doing on their traditional homelands that they can use support and, and, and voice with? Um, really looking at climate change. Um, oh, so yeah, going to, um, um, I don't know more. It's just one place for leading people to kind of a clearinghouse place to go check in on what's going on with indigenous sovereignty. Um, 350.org, um, organization Bill McKibben started for climate change. Um, the Ancient Forest Alliance and Endangered Ecosystems Alliance in BC doing a lot of work to protect the inland temperature. And then um, Wild Sight and NBC and Conservation Northwest here in Washington for a specific care of the conservation group. So those are places that we're sending folks. And you can always, of course, learn more through our website at caribouraineforest.org. Um, find out about action steps, updates, blog posts, what organizations are up to, uh, current events, and things like that. We also have a Facebook page, Mountain Caribou Initiative Facebook page. Um, and hashtag Mountain Caribou Initiative on Instagram if you're a social media person. Um, just to, we're continuing to tell stories and give updates on that. So you can post a talk or a screening of our documentary if you want. You can see the trailer on there. I was going to show it, but 515 came quick. So for folks that stick around, we can show the trailer of that. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, follow us. And uh, I can, I've got a card up here. I'd love to meet and greet folks, take some questions, whatever that is. But, um, that's just a little bit about what I do, what I'm up to, and why I think this is the way it's going. So, 